Well, I'm so sorry I can't be with you today in person, but uh, you'll appreciate that uh, having had uh, a positive COVID test in the family, we felt it was wise just to stay away, although uh, we are pretty healthy. Um, so let me reassure you as well that, uh, especially with Simon being on holiday, uh, I'm well, I am still working. If you need to contact me, please do feel very free to do that. Uh, you just probably won't see me face to face uh, for a short while until we check that we're all properly negative. We're looking at the book of Proverbs again this morning, thinking about the uh, theme of speaking and listening. Uh, and since obviously uh, we can't show uh, my PowerPoint at the same time as this video, uh, I produced for you just a list of Proverbs, the Proverbs I'll be referring to, because we're going through them pretty quickly. So hopefully you've got them to hand, JCB, you've got them all on a sheet but you've got some blanks to fill in as you go. Well, careless talk costs lives. That's what the wartime slogan said, wasn't it? Uh, under the conditions of war, you, you never knew who the people around you may be and what the impact of your words may be. Well, it's a slogan that would be uh, right at home amongst the teaching of Proverbs, which is really deeply concerned with our speaking, with our listening and with the effects that, that has upon others. In fact, <clears throat> when I went through uh, chapters 10 to 31 of Proverbs, which is where the main bulk of the, the short, short Proverbs are, I ended up with a list of no less than 64 Proverbs to do with speaking and listening. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that I decided against going through all of them this morning. But at the same time, I am going to give you quite a lot because I want to show you something of the breadth of wis uh, Proverbs wisdom on this topic. So if you like, this, this sermon is the, uh, the Chinese all-you-can-eat buffet approach that, that possibly will leave you kind of feeling sort of stuffed at the end and not knowing what to do with yourself. Uh, at least yeah, that's if you approach uh, Chinese all-you-can-eat buffets in the way that I do. Um, but uh, amid all these Proverbs, be on the lookout, especially for any that come perhaps knocking on the door of your own hearts. Uh, I'll, I'll have something more to say about that, <clears throat> what to do with that at the end. But how about this then for a starter summary? Uh, it's both uh, an ancient warning from around uh, probably 900 BC that careless talk costs lives. But it's also an encouragement that wise words bring great blessing. And that's uh, chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So clearly we need to listen up because we will speak on average 16,000 words today. Uh, and gents, I know what you're thinking. and It's not true. There is no significant gender gap in the average number of words used per day. And then on top of that, of course, there's the thousands of words that we listen to, both in conversation and on the TV and on the radio. At the average time, in fact, watching TV last year was three hours a day. That's a lot of time allowing other people's words into your minds. How do you listen well? course we need to add that again because in addition to that we will hear many thousands of words we will write and read more words on social media which is a newer arena of society where these proverbs are very urgently relevant as it dominates the lives of so many people in fact the average person spent a stunning two hours and 24 minutes a day on social media the average whatsapp user opens the app between 23 and 25 times a day. Unless, of course, there's been a global outage, uh, as there was this week. So very clearly, we need wisdom if we're going to shape such a massive component of our lives and bring it into line with the reality of the gospel. And what I hope to show you is that the wisdom of Proverbs is doing just that. It fits our speaking and our listening into the pattern that fits if the gospel is true. So I'm going to look under, at these Proverbs just under two headings this morning. First of all, let's look at the power of words. 
power of words. We all know the, the emptiness of the saying, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We all know that's nonsense. Our words are powerful. And consider a different proverb, a true proverb from chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the wicked are like a murderous ambush, but the words of the godly save lives. We may well think that these things uh, speak about the actions of, great, of the great, or of leaders. Uh, I've got a book here at home uh, called Speeches That Change the World. Uh, it contains many of the words that have spoken, been spoken, that have, have, have changed history for good, Stegel. Churchill's speeches that galvanised the nation against the Nazi threat. Uh, they've got uh, JFK's speech at the Berlin Wall. Uh, it's known as Ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, it's a speech that was credited with marking a turning point in the Cold War. Of course, it's got Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. But it also contains other words. It's got Lenin's words in a speech he made called Power to the Soviets that, that led to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and all the misery that brought for millions across Russia and Eastern Europe and the communists seized power. It's got words of Hitler in there that are filled with lies but massively shaped the course of the 20th century. What about our words? We might have perhaps let ourselves off the hook because our words don't have those kind of effects. But it's crucial to ask, well, are my words always those that could be classified as the words of the godly? Or are there perhaps times when our words leave blood on the floor, if you like, from the bleeding hearts that we leave behind when we leave a room? What effect do our words have those on, on those around us? It's a proverb that should cause us to stop and reflect on the relationships that we've damaged or even destroyed by our words, as well as other kinds of relationships that have been built and have been nurtured by a very different kind of words. This is how chapter 15, verse 4 puts it. Gentle words are a tree of life. The deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Wonderful imagery, tree of life. Cast your mind back to the Garden of Eden, isn't it? That's where the tree of life is. It's the effect of gentle words. Or so chapter 16, verse 24, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Now, even when faced with difficult relationships, still this wisdom holds. Still, words are our most powerful weapon but only not in the way that perhaps we tend to use them in those difficult situations. Chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer deflects answer. Sorry, let me try again. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. That's the real power of words. In fact, Chapter 25, verse 15, puts it like this. Patience can persuade a prince and soft speech can break bones. You see, those who are truly wise know how to resist the temptation to sort of put up those walls of angry self-defense. And instead, they have the insight to gently erode the defenses of the other person. Bring reconciliation instead of alienation. Because the problem is, if we're honest with ourselves, how often are we more like the fool of chapter 18, verses six and seven, which tells us that fool's words get them into constant quarrels. They are asking for a beating. The mouths of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. I think we're being so wise that we are so obviously in the right when we speak those words, and yet we only make our situation worse. We only create deeper division, more anger. That isn't the way of wisdom. 
our words have real power. They change the world. It's not only the world's words of the great leaders on the world stage. So that, of course, means our words can do real harm. And we are fooling ourselves if we just try and excuse ourselves. Chapter 25, verse 18. Telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an axe, wounding them with a sword or shooting them with a sharp arrow. But it's not just about when we want to lash out either. We need to keep our watch and our words at all other times as well. Think about chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. Just as damaging as a madman shooting a deadly weapon is someone who lies to a friend and then says, I was only joking. There's a, a thoughtless, selfish kind of joking that brings distress to others, simply to bring entertainment to myself. You JC Beers, I think this, this proverb in chapter 26 is describing is something that most of us did when we were around your age. I see it so often in, in young people, teenagers. Think about this proverb. When you tease or deceive your friends or others in your class or your brothers and sisters, whoever it is, why are you doing it? It's great to have a bit of banter, and I hope you have plenty of banter with your friends. But the question is always, are they enjoying the joke? And the answer to that question will tell you whether or not you've crossed that line. See, the sad truth is that all too often we're enjoying ourselves by hurting those around us in those situations. The more you do it, the more you tear that person down. Who knows what that will do to that person? This proverb says this is serious. Proverbs says it's like swinging a deadly weapon at them. And one thing is for sure, you aren't building your friendship in those times. Proverbs says we need to think about the words that we use at those times. Let me give you one last proverb on the dangerous power of our words in chapter 26, verse 28, because it's a little bit surprising. It gives us another angle to think about. It begins straightforwardly enough. A lying tongue hates its victims. I think we'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? Not along, absolutely. But what kind of lying does the proverb have in mind? He goes on, and flattering words cause ruin. I doubt that was the ending we would have expected from that first line, is it? We don't think of our flattering words, perhaps, but lies. I mean, think of an easy example. Do you remember those painful X Factor auditions? And the judges were faced with someone whose singing sounded like a strangled cat, but whose family and friends had all been egging them on. You, you can do it. You're amazing. What did those flattering words achieve? They made their loved one a national object of ridicule. That was not real love. It was a warped kind of love because it didn't actually want what was best for that person. It just wanted to make them feel good, which is a very different thing. If we want to love truly, we must be willing when we have the right opportunity in, in those relationships where we have that bridge in the right way with the right motive to give difficult feedback. To be prepared to say what people may not want to hear, to offer an honest evaluation of something that needs to change. Because as chapter 24, 26 puts it, an honest answer is like a kiss of friendship. It's a theme that comes up a number of times in Proverbs. We haven't got time to look at all of them. But an honest answer is like the kiss of friendship. It's the mark of a true friend. That is great wisdom for all of us. But I just want to highlight before we move on that this shouldn't surprise us. And the reason it does shouldn't surprise us is because this is the shape of God's world because the true and living God is a speaking God. Think about it, when he spoke 
and the world came into obedience, uh, came into being, so, sorry, in obedience to that. Uh, and we are then those who are created in his image, we're told, to reflect him in all kinds of miniature ways. So if God's words are so powerful, we should expect our words to be powerful too. And God's words remain powerful words, life-giving words. That wasn't something that happened only in the creation of Genesis 1. And Psalm 119 is a long song of delight in God's word for all its power at work in the life of a believer. Uh, and this is how the psalmist puts it in verse 93. He says, I will never forget your commandments, for by them you give me life. I'll never forget what you said, Lord. The commandments is one of the, the words he uses regularly for God's word through the psalm, because by those words you give me life. How does the powerful effects then of your words and mine measure up? against the speaking God whom we're to reflect. Are our words life-giving? Or are they destructive words? As the very opposite of God's words. That is the challenge that these proverbs call us to consider. That is the power of our words, for good or ill. But secondly, it's crucial that we also think about the importance of stopping talking. The importance of stopping talking. Uh, we love to talk. Uh, and one of the key reasons for that in many situations is that it, can, it kind of gives us a sense of importance. You know, knowledge is power. and it, it presents me as someone who knows what I'm talking about. I've got something to offer on this subject. It means, therefore, that we actually we keep on talking when we have nothing worth saying. Uh, and the media it even seems to encourage this often. You get, well, quite frankly, silly polls. These wind up a little bit. Just bear with me a moment. You know, I read this week that nearly half of us expect another lockdown this winter. And over 70% of us expect a significant rise in COVID cases. Here's the thing. The only honest answer to the question is, what do you think will happen? Is, I have no idea. I have, a, I have a degree in microbiology and I have no idea what's going to happen this winter. Even the most informed scientists are only giving us their best guess and their best models. models. Why would you ask me about something that I have no meaningful contribution to make to you know an element of wisdom is knowing when you have something to say and when to keep quiet i have no idea about that but you know i do have a science degree so i i did know enough to reply to people who sent me posts about covid vaccines that contain the most incredible ignorance of the most basic biology then I could speak because I was able to try and reassure them that actually they've been fed information that was misinformed in the extreme. You know, these were posts created by people who didn't know when they had reached the limits of their knowledge. And so they thought they were being wise, but actually they were broadcasting empty opinions about things they didn't understand. You know, Proverbs reminds of this. Uh, in lots of different situations. Chapter 13, verse 3. It's perhaps a, a good headline statement for us. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. And bring you so much conflict, so much suffering. The wise have a robust safety catch on the root from the brain to the mouth, and they know to use it routinely. <clears throat> How many relationships have been shipwrecked on the rocks that this proverb is highlighting to us? I wonder how will I know when to speak uh, and when to keep silence? <clears throat> well, apart from considering whether I really have something to say, 
whether I really know what I'm talking about. Here's another angle. <clears throat> Have you ever thought about where this other person is coming from? Or do you simply go charging in to say what you've got to say without a thought for them and how they're doing? <clears throat> 20, chapter 27, verse 14 gives us an interesting perspective on that. A loud and cheerful greeting early in the morning will be taken as a curse. You may be feeling chipper and full of beans at 6 a.m. If you decide to, to display that loudly to your neighbours at that time, it shows the most basic failure of love, a failure to consider how to love the other person, which suggests a lack of awareness that arises from self-centred thinking, only thinking of my own state of mind and well, how do most other people feel at six in the morning? So we want to be people who are slow to speak. Chapter 12, verse 15. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Well, which of these others I should listen to? Bear in mind, chapter 14, verse 7, stay away from fools, for you won't find knowledge on their lips. So we want to be listening to those in whom we find these characteristics of the wise that we find. But by way of contrast, wise listen to others. Chapter 18, verse 2, fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. It feels good to put my opinions out there. It feels like I'm someone in the know, someone who ought to be consulted, someone who has insights. We're all too often what we have are opinions that perhaps aren't based on much more than some headlines we read or an article I read once or something I heard from a friend or some vague similarity to something I once experienced. You know, <clears throat> in reality, chapter 15, verse 28, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. It takes time to grow in wisdom. It takes time to find out whether I have enough to actually make a truly wise contribution to a discussion. We need to remember that more than ever in an age of sound bites on the news and information communicated in tweetable snippets. Because almost no issue can be understood properly on the basis of such tiny amounts of information. What that can, information can do and what it's used to do all too often is, is to just to kind of try and rally us to the cause, even though we don't really understand the complexity of the issues. We want to be wise and know when we have insight ability to speak helpfully on a subject. <clears throat> you won't find at me offering extensive opinions when we talk about church finances and members meetings. That's simply not something I know about. I want to be guided by the wisdom of who those who understand financial issues far better than I do. Do we understand what those issues are for ourselves? Let me warn you too that Sometimes Christians who do love the gospel can act like this. We've got this certain amount of knowledge of the gospel that we understand. And we take that as a hard and fast thing by which we uh, use to, to judge the, the opinions of others about the Bible's teaching. Uh, but our standard is not actually what the Bible teaches. It's what I already think about what the Bible teaches. That's actually something that takes away from me the possibility of learning from the Bible. It takes away from me the possibility of growing. That's what happens in this uh, situation. The fool uh, that only wants to air his own opinions, who thinks his own way is right, he's actually trapped in an echo chamber of his own thoughts with no way of growing, no way of expanding his understanding because he doesn't actually listen. 
So in a Bible study group, I might simply assert what I already think in such a way that I'm not actually listening to what this part of the Bible is saying. And so actually, I just remain in ignorance. I've been in groups like that. Let's be careful how we listen. Let's be eager to listen. The wise listen carefully. They listen to those who disagree with them, with what they have to say. They consider whether they need to change their own views before they respond. Chapter 18, verse 17 uh, paints a courtroom scene for us. The first to speak in court sounds right until the cross-examination begins. First story sounds so convincing until someone comes along and, and asks questions of it and highlights things I hadn't thought about. Perhaps you've had that experience when you've been uh, reading a book to discover something about and uh, discover something about a new subject, and the first book sounds convincing and you're, you're sold absolutely. But if you ever read another book on the subject, it gives you another perspective. Ah, maybe this first writer hadn't got everything quite in order. It's true in, the, in, true in court. It's true in Bible study groups. It's true in relationship breakdowns of various kinds, where he says, she says, uh, it takes place so much. It's, it's true in so many other arenas of life. You know, above all, the wise know the importance of stopping talking because the wise want to be instructed. They want to listen. Chapter 10, verse 8. The wise are glad to be instructed. The babbling fools who won't shut up with their own all their own ideas fall flat on their faces. But the wisdom of Proverbs puts it even more strongly than that. To the one who listens... Valid criticism is like a gold earring or other gold jewellery. Chapter 25, verse 12. Is that how you feel when you receive criticism? It's like a precious, precious uh, adornment. It's going to help you. It's going to uh, adorn your own thinking, make you uh, wiser. The wise want to be instructed. JCB, here's another one. For you, it's not popular to say it, but chapter 13, verse 1 is reality. A wise child accepts a parent's discipline. But a mocker refuses to, live to cor listen to correction. It, it's part of God's good order of creation that we are dependent on our parents to shape us and to help us to grow. And if you ever meet those who... Um, didn't have that blessing as children. They are often those who will struggle to be wise as adults. But you know, it's not just for you, because parents, uh, all of us, need direction from others if we will be wise. Chapter 15, verses 31 and 32 forms a good summary for us. It says, if you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home among the wise. If you reject discipline, uh, and that word is a, is a word that has a sense of, of training and instruction. If you reject discipline, training, instruction, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. Again, I have one last question as we close. We did the last point. Why do all these proverbs describe reality? Why do they describe us so well? Well, reality is like this because we are created as creatures who need to stop talking and listen. Humanity was created to be dependent on God's word, which we've seen was so powerful. Even in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were sinless, that was still true. They were to be dependent on God's word. They did not know all they needed to know. And our problem is the very heartbeat of sin is to reject that dependence on God and to assert that actually our own wisdom is quite sufficient. Thank you very much. And so we keep talking and keep talking and keep talking just to make ourselves feel wise. 
And that's one reason why so many people can't imagine giving their lives to Christ. Because that means admitting that I need something beyond myself that I can't provide. So it's no surprise that the New Testament describes Jesus as God's wisdom for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Everything that we need is encapsulated in this one person. And that's why the wise are so eager to listen to others, because those who are wise have discovered that I do not have all the resources that I need. I am small and I am limited. My very nature is that I'm dependent on the wisdom of God that's shown in Jesus Christ. And once I recognise my own limitation, well, it makes perfect sense to seek out slivers of that wisdom from wherever we can find it. I pray that we'll be those who join the ranks of the wise, knowing that, that God has made us to live together in a dependent community, speaking words of life to one another, stopping to hear the words of those around us, to listen, to engage, to grow in wisdom as we seek out wise voices to impact our own lives. We don't want to be those who live in the splendid isolation of imaginary castles that are actually just echo chambers of what we believe to be our own superior wisdom. Remember, the stakes are very high. Careless talk and careless listening costs lives. It brings destruction in all kinds of ways into our lives. Ultimately, it will keep us from Christ if we simply will not admit our own need of wisdom, our own need for the wisdom of God in our own lives. Well, I said I'll tell you what to do with all this. I've given you the all-you-can-eat buffet, uh, and you've got a list of all the proverbs that we've looked at this morning. Here's what I want you to do. From this huge buffet, you choose no more than a few that have just seemed to have particular resonance in your own life. And then from this all-you-can-eat approach, just take those, and you want to treat those rather than the, the buffet, treat them more like a boiled sweet. So when you put it in your mouth and you, you work on it and you get more and more from it as you roll it around. Spend some time thinking about it. It might be helpful to, to write it down, make a spider diagram, so write the proverb in the middle of the piece of paper and then begin to unpack its relevance for you. Situations in your life where you remember you can see how the warning of that proverb came true, how the blessing of that proverb have also come true, places where you feel you're weak, places where you particularly feel a need to apply this wisdom. Uh, and as you do that, the wisdom of these Proverbs will become embedded slowly, more in our lives. Let me encourage you to do that from the list of Proverbs you have. Uh, but as we close, we are going to need the wisdom of God. Aren't we? We're going to need the power of God that we may grow in wisdom. So we're going to sing Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Now I'll hand back to Rod to close us in prayer.